Hi everybody, welcome back to the lectures on polymer science and processing. This is the very final part of our entire course and we will continue discussing the processing of polymers. So let me directly put on the slide here. This is where we, where we stopped last time. We've seen that we can somewhat categorize all our um, processing approaches and techniques according to the state of the polymer, so whether it's in the melt or in solution or in dispersion and in powder. And last week we already uh, we focused on these parts here, especially on melt processing and we discussed if you want the basic processes that are required to make polymer materials or polymer products. We discussed extrusion and learned about the importance of the screw, this reciprocating screw. Then we looked at injection molding, discussed process parameters and approaches and, and difficulties and challenges and so on. And then we looked at blow molding and forming as somewhat a bit more specialized parameters. And what we've seen is that we really need to have understanding, fundamental understanding of polymer science, for example, the class transition temperature, chemical properties of polymers and so on in order to tailor and control and optimize our processes. And this is how it all somewhat uh, belongs together and is connected together all the way from the very molecular properties of our polymers and monomers to the macroscopic dimensions and properties of these huge polymer processing machines. It all somewhat are facets of the same topic. Okay, today we want to go on and discuss a few more if you want specialized approaches or some other approaches and I just picked some approaches of, um, that take advantage of polymers either in the solid, uh, soluble state, so individual polymer chains dissolved in a solvent, or in the dispersed state where we have solid polymer particles that are surrounded by typically water or an external uh, uh, phase that is not a solvent of the polymer, otherwise these particles would dissolve, but simply act as kind of a liquid environment for these polymer particles. And then we look a little bit into powder and discuss um, additive manufacturing as one of these key emerging um, processing techniques or the, the series of techniques to make uh, bespoke tailored uh, materials in any shape and so on. Okay, so let's first recapitulate a little bit which kind of uh, materials or which kind of products do we know that take advantage of certain processes. So if you think about spray coating, what do you do where do you spray coat polymers? In which applications? Well, for example, car paints. They are typically applied as spray coating of a dis dissolved liquid or a dissolved polymer in an organic solvent. This is why you need to have these special, uh, specially ventilated materials. And then it dries out and forms a very hard scratch resistant coating that is very useful to protect, for example, your car. But also in graffiti is where you use polymers because you want to make sure that your colorful pigments that you have in your graffiti material actually remain on the wall and do not fall off easily. So in this case, you need the polymer as a binder material. Well, in spin coating is maybe a little bit more um, exotic for like key or hardcore polymer engineers, but this is a really important topic for a process that is known as photolithography, which I will discuss in a little bit more detail in a second. So this forms the basis to make any kinds of CDs, DVDs, uh, Blu-rays and so on, and also of semiconductor chips, so whatever is powers your cell phone, my laptop, uh, all kinds of whatever devices um, and so on, is made by photolithography. So polymers, as you will see, play a very fundamental and also very first step in the development of such devices. Okay. These all operate on using polymer chains that are dissolved in a solvent, so a liquid material. Then there's also processes that take care of polymers in a dispersion. So as I said, the polymer is in a solid state, but the surrounding medium is a liquid. That's what is known as a dispersion. And one example of a, dis of a dispersion process is dispersion paints. And these we use to paint our walls. Oh, next time you move, you typically either need to renovate your apartment after you move out or before you move in or you want to. And what you put on a wall is either a colorful or a white paint. This contains pigments to make it white or colorful, but it also needs to contain polymers again as a binder so that the paint sticks to the wall. 
And what we want to do in today's lecture is compare a little bit the differences and advantages and maybe disadvantages of using a solution-based paint that is used, for example, in the car industry and a dispersion-based paint that is, for example, used indoors when you paint your house. So we see in these different colors. Well, and then there is dip coating, which is even simpler if you want. Instead of painting your dispersion to a wall, you dip your material in and then you let it come out and let it dry and then it forms a solid film. And strikingly, an example of what is done by dip coating are condoms. And now we, will, we can discuss this in a little bit more detail when we discuss this, but it's very astonishing that you can be so, or you can so efficiently merge together individual solid particles that you can really make a very whole free co um, homogeneous coating, which of course is fairly important when you think about condoms. No? You don't want to have holes in them. But also kind of rubber handles, no? anything that is polymer protected metals can be done by the dip coating process. And so can be polishing materials, for example, the surface coating of bowling balls. So also there you need to dip it into something and then let it dry out and then it will form a very homogeneous shiny layer around it. Well, in the last example that we can also process powders, we had this example of polystyrene or styrofoam to be precise in last week's lecture. That's of course also an example on how powder can be used. Here I picked a slightly different example of additive manufacturing or to be precise of selective laser uh, sintering or um, uh, powder-based polymer fusion processes. And what you do there is you have a polymer powder in a building chamber and then you heat up with a laser the polymer powder at certain areas and by this fuse the powder particles together and then you can build up your material in a layer by layer fashion and then out can come a very complicated object that is really fabricated, customized and in a bespoken way by this selective laser sintering process. That's also something I want to discuss in, in a little bit more detail in a second. So you see um, these processes are fairly either widely used or very promising or interesting aspects of polymer fabrication. And now I want to walk you through these step by step to discuss why they can be important. And I want to start with spin coating. And as I already said, spin coating forms the basis of photolithography. And photolithography is a process that is used to structure the surface of a material. And the surface can be a semiconductor, such as silicon, for example, and if it is, then you can create computer chips. Now here you see this is kind of a complete wafer and you have these very small chips that are being printed on this wafer. And if you look at this more in a cartoon style, this is a CPU processor that, as I said, powers like smartphones, computers, all kinds of fancy devices. And of course they become cheaper and cheaper. So you have them in cars and uh, probably by now your fridge as well. And all of these need to be fabricated in order to function. And now asking how a computer chip functions is an extremely hard question. And I doubt that a lot of people really understand this in all its details, you know, from software aspects, hardware aspects, fabrication aspects. And it, it requires tremendous expertise to do this. And I'm not saying that polymers are, are a very um, decisive factor in this. But without polymers, we wouldn't have any computer chips. And why that is, we will explain in a second, is because we apply them in photolithography. But just to give you a very short kind of flavor why this is important, even if you don't really know a lot about computer chips, uh, what is kind of common knowledge is that they operate by a digital unit that they can convert either ones or zeros, so a binary system. And this is typically controlled by a signal that comes from a current running. So current on or current off, which then creates a zero. And in order to create such binary systems, a certain device called a transistor is typically used. Let me just very briefly show you how a transistor, how a transistor work. And I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware that this is not part of a polymer lecture. This is more whatever elementary physics or semiconductor physics and so on. But it serves as an inst instructive example on why we need photolithography. So how it, what a transistor does, and in this special case, it's known as a thin film transistor. What you have is um, a substrate. And on this substrate, 
you have an electrode one and an electrode two. This is known as source and drain. And what you want to control is the current that flows between them, so from here to here. So you either want to allow a current to flow or you want to not allow this. And how you do this is by creating an active material here. This is known as the gate dielectric. And you control the properties of this gate dielectric by a third electrode, which let me just put this in here. And this is the gate electrode. So now what is, what is happening is that when you switch on voltage here, so you apply a voltage to the gate, then it will polarize this dielectric film. So for example, it accumulates charges here. And these charges then allow a current running from here to here. And now if you switch it off, the voltage here, then these polarization disappears. That means that this charge separation disappears. And that means that you don't get that the circuit here is broken and you don't get a current running from one to two. So what you do is you switch these modes via the gate. Okay, and now with 100,000 more complicated steps, at the end of the day, somehow, if you want, magically a computer appears from this that will um, be powerful enough to power exactly that lecture that I'm currently giving to you. But without really going into details, and to be honest, I also don't know exactly how a computer then, then emerges and know how, how complicated everything is, what we can clearly see from this picture in order to make such a thing, we need to define that at certain locations we have a metal, like here and here, and at others we don't. So this entire thing boils down to, in a very fundamental step, boils down that we need to have localized metal their position. Right? Otherwise, we cannot make a source and a drain, and without this, we cannot have a transistor. And now this boils down to that we need to selectively block the surface. And, of course, also local. And this is what, what photolithography does. It, it positions a polymer film at defined regions of the surface. And if you have a polymer film, then you can deposit metal. Just as a continuous film. make the metal in, in red here to avoid confusion. So now I deposit a metal film, which will be here. It will also be here. And it will be here. So I simply put the entire substrate into a metal evaporator, so a machine that can deposit thin films of metal. I coat the entire area, so I don't bother about the structuring, because I already did the structuring with a polymer. And then I just need to remove the polymer film because along with the polymer film this metal will also go away. This is known as a lift off. And if I do this, then at the very least I have my first step. And created these two electrodes. You know you can imagine you can 
do this process over and over again, and then it becomes more complicated. But at a very fundamental step, what we need to be able to do all these complicated chips and the computer CPU, which boils down to a transistor, which very fundamentally boils down to this metal deposition, and this boils down to this one here. And this is what I want to discuss with you. Okay, this is how a polymer enters the process chain of a computer. Okay, so this just is kind of a short introduction. And now before we even discuss how to make um, a localized polymer film, we need to first form a complete polymer film over the substrate. And this is done by spin coating. So what do we do there? We take our very specialized polymer, which we will discuss in a second, we dissolve it in an organic solvent so that we have a solution of this polymer. And then we add the solution to our substrate. Now it's a liquid, so it, it will flow over the substrate. And then we spin it really quickly so that the solution covers the entire substrate. And because of the rotation, it will very quickly evaporate the solvent. And as a result, we have a thin film of a polymer that remains on the substrate. So it's a very simple process. You see this here again. We apply our solution. Then we start to rotate. And by this, the film thins out, becomes flat, and it evaporates. And then we're left with a solid film. And now, of course, um, if we want to exercise more control of this, we want to control the thickness of the film and so on. And this can be controlled via the concentration of the polymer. It's somewhat obvious because the higher the, the concentration, the, the thicker the film. But it's also a function of the solvent, so the viscosity or the vapor pressure, depending a little bit on how fast it evaporates, the, the, the thicker the film will get, because less will fly away. But if it's too fast, it may not form a completely uniform coating. And it also depends on the spin speed and the spin time, because this also controls how fast the evaporation process is. And this can be done by a relatively simple machine. So this is a spin coater from our lab. What you see here is this is just a protection so that you don't mess around with the entire hood. Then you have a sample holder. Here is an O-ring and a connection to vacuum here. This vacuum then goes in the back you know, to, to suck vacuum. This entire um, table here will rotate. And here we have a digital controller of the spin speed, the spin time, the acceleration, and so on and so forth. And now we will move over to the lab. And Julia and Eric will show you how this spin coater works. So what they will do is they will simply apply this machine to coat a thin layer of a polymer film that you will just see on the substrate, um, just to give you an impression on how this works. So off to the lab, and we will look at this. Okay, so now we have seen it's really a matter of seconds to form a polymer film, and this is why it's very widely used whenever you want to look into, into thin films of polymers and coat your substrates and so on and so forth. But the most important thing, as we said, is spin coating, uh, is photolithography. So what we want to do is we spin coat a photoresist, we anneal it a little bit, and what we will then do is we will expose this film through UV light with a mask, so that at the end of the day, we can develop our structures. And this is something that I want to show you on the blackboard as well. Because it directly feeds into what I discussed here on how to make the surface patterning. So just maybe to recapitulate, 
our target is, let's put this in here, we have a polymer film and at the end of the day we only want to have a part of that film that is being uh, remaining or that remains on the substrate while the other one is removed. So somewhat this is So now we need to apply all our knowledge about polymer science to understand what we can do to change these properties so that we can remove parts of a film and not the other one. And a little hint is that we will need to apply, what we typically apply UV light to do this. So maybe let's first look at the entire process and meanwhile you can already keep this in mind what we need to change in the polymers in order to either remove them or not. Okay, so let's look at the processes first. We start with a spin coating to create a thin polymer film on a substrate. So here's the substrate, here's our polymer film. So second, we now expose this film to UV light. So again, here's our substrate. Here's our film, and now we have a mask. And this mask is only transparent to UV light at certain regions. So here it's transparent, here it blocks the UV light. And that means that UV light pretty much only enters the surface here. And that means it does something with the polymer film in this region that we will now exploit. Now there is two different ways on how we can run this process. So the third is how do I, where do I put this? So now we development, we develop the structures. And now, as a hint, we use a solvent. So we shine our solid polymer film with UV light for a few seconds, and then we put it into a solvent, and this now selectively dissolves certain parts of the material. And there's two options. Option one is, or option A, we have what is known as a negative tone. photo resist and this is of course very bad style we should always start with the positive news but in any case so the negative tone resist what it does is it creates structures on the substrate where only the areas that have been exposed by UV light remain on the surface. Okay, and well, if there's negative things, there's also positive things. Approach B. Positive tone. And in this case, only the areas that have not been exposed remain on the surface.
So in our example here, we have the surface here. And now this one will be developed, this will be removed, and these parts remain. And I'm not making any dashes because they haven't been exposed to the UV light. So now, my question to you is, what happens here? How can we either make the polymer stick where it has been exposed, or we, where we can make it stick where it has not been exposed? Now take a second and try to think about it, especially in all the terms of polymer properties that we have discussed. Okay, let's start with the negative tone resist. Here, apparently, we induce changes so that whatever has been exposed to the UV light remains on the surface. And for this, we, we capitalize on one of the properties where how we can change the solubility of a polymer film. And remember that when we discussed that um, cross-linked, or when we discussed cross-linking, we realized that cross-linking means that polymer chains are being bond together. And if the cross-linking density is high, they cannot even be surrounded by solvent anymore. If the cross-linking density is low, remember they can swell up, they form gels, diapers, and so on. But if it's very cross-linked, then the solvent cannot enter these structures anymore, so it cannot dissolve the structures. However, when it's not cross-linked and we apply a solvent that actually likes to surround the polymer chains, of course these regions will be dissolved. So here we apply a cross-linking reaction triggered by UV light so that this part of the surface is cross-linked and when I put it in a solvent it cannot dissolve, while this part here is not cross-linked and can therefore dissolve. So that's the key here. How can I now make this one here? How can I induce a polymer? Well, how can I make the polymer soluble when I induce it by to UV light? Now we need to exploit another properties of polymers. We know polymers are not extremely well soluble. Now, if you remember what we discussed in the Flory Huggins theory, the entropy of mixing for polymers is really low, and it all depends on the enthalpy of mixing to make up for this loss in entropy. That means you really need to find very defined solvent polymer pairs to make it soluble. Or in other words, the, the combination of solvent and polymer is much more delicate compared to small molecules. Now we can exploit this property in two terms. If we want to make sure the middle part is soluble, we need to induce a change in polarity. If we make the exposed area more polar, then we can find a solvent that only dissolves the more polar part, but not this one here. So what we need is a UV-induced change in polarity. This will give us a selective dissolution of the new, newly exposed area. Or we can capitalize on the fact that the polymers do not dissolve so well anyways, and the longer the polymer chains, the worse they dissolve. That's also a direct consequence of the Flory Huggins theory. So if we use our UV light to degrade the polymer, to make it to degrade it into monomers, then we can also easier dissolve it. This is often used, this effect is often used in E-beam lithography, where instead of UV light, we shoot electron beams onto the material, but both are direct results of the Flory Huggins theory or of the limited solubility of these polymer chains. And you see, this will directly lead to removal of the exposed areas. So last question, why is this called negative tone resist and this one positive tone resist? Well, here, the pattern that remains on the surface is the inverse of the pattern we have on the mask. Hence, this creates the negative image. And here, the pattern that remains on the surface 
is the direct replication of the mask. So it's if you want the positive image of the mask. This is why this one is called the positive and this one is called the negative tone resist. Okay, so this is the very basic principle of photolithography that can be applied to structure a film. And now, of course, reality is much more complicated and I just want to show you a couple of aspects on how this chemistry can be triggered. So here, you see this again. This is the chemistry used for a negative tone photoresist. And here the principle is that we, as we said, induce cross-linking. And how this is done is by using a photoacid generator. So this is the polymer, how it looks like. You see very clearly it's a linear polymer, so it can be dissolved. And it's a fairly complicated monomer. It has these, uh, these uh, benzophenone type of building, uh, sorry, these, these bisphenol A type of building blocks. They are connected here by linear chains and the, it has side chains that has epoxy groups. And now recall that epoxy groups can be polymerized either by acids or by bases. And that's something that we also discussed in our polymer lecture. And the reason is that this bond here is very polarized and there is a high strain in the ring. So there's an incentive to open the ring and undergo a reaction. And what is uh, what we do in the process now, we apply UV light and then we add a photoacid and this is a specialized molecule and I don't want to go into detail because this will be a little bit too much chemistry but this molecule undergoes a change and becomes an acid under exposure to the photoresist. By the way, you will see in a second an example of such a photoacid. So this acid can then be induced to polymerize these groups. This will induce cross-linking of these areas at each of these monomer bridges, you get two crosslinks, and that makes it a very hard and very highly crosslinked materials that will not be soluble anymore. So that's the principle of this negative tone photoresist. So here you see an example of this, this SU8 series, that's a very typical positive tone resist, and you see the thickness of these structures can be tuned from single nanometers to 40, 50, even 100. And this is examples of such surface structures that can be generated. So you see here, the scale bar is one micrometer. So you can actually, if you do this well, you can make very small structures, you can make lines and so on and so forth. And this all comes from the fact that, that you very uh, decisively expose your, your structures with defined masks. Okay, how does the positive tone photoresist work? So in this case, the chemistry is even more complicated, but the principle is, as we discussed, fairly, si fairly uh, simple. We change the polymer solubility upon exposure to UV light. And here is an example of such a polymer. So you see, again, it's a linear polymer chain. It's based on a Novolac. So this may remind you of these um, phenol formaldehyde resins that we discussed um, in the very beginning of our step um, growth polymerization techniques but it has a very complicated side chain. So see, attached to this polymer backbone is a structure that is really big and it has these diazonaftokinone units attached to, uh, to this oxygen here and here. And these ones look like this. Okay, this is bound to this polymer. And you see, again, a very complicated structure. And now, if I shine UV light onto these functional units, it undergoes a rearrangement known as the Suez mechanism, and we don't need to go into detail in this case, but it, you, know, you see the, the six-membered ring becomes a five-membered ring, and it rearranges into this um, ketene type of structure. And with traces of water, this then hydrolyzes and forms an acid. This is an example of a photoacid that is formed, because the acid is released only upon exposure to UV light. So now you have converted these groups here to an acid group and we know that an acid group in water or especially in basic solutions will be deprotonized and this will create two charges here, no COO minus charges. And of course this is much more polar than this one here. And this means now after having exposed your, your uh, polymer film to the UV light and after having, underwent, uh, having undergone transformations into this photoacid, 
you can now develop it in aqueous basic solutions because there the exposed parts that have the photo acid will be soluble, will be water soluble, while the rest will be not. So very clearly you, you change the, the polarity and then exploit this to selectively remove parts of your surface. Okay, so how does this work in real life? This is just some random examples of processing steps to show you how this works. First, we spin coat our photoresist. So you see here it's added. Here it's just flying away from the spin coater. Then we have a thin film of this polymer. Next, we design a chromium mask. So you see here, wherever it's, um, it's bright, we will have light that goes through. Wherever it's dark, chromium is covering this. And then you can create arbitrary structures on this mask. So you very clearly see this contrast here. And then we expose the entire surface by something that is known as a mask aligner. Even two in here. And you see, this is how it works. Here you put your substrate. Then this entire uh, machine goes inwards. Here you have a huge UV lamp. And then after hitting a button, this entire UV lamp shines its UV lamp or shines the UV light onto the surface. And you put your mask on top here to pattern the surface. And you also see that everything is in this uh, weird um, yellow tone images. You see this even better here. Everything is yellow and that's very clear. In such a clean room where you do these processes, you want to avoid white light because white light has UV components and then your photoresist may be um, irradiated and exposed already before you start the process. So here they take really care to cut out the spectrum of light that is available to um, wavelengths that cannot harm your photoresist. Okay, so you expose in this machine and then you simply develop it and you see this is what these persons here are doing. You see you have the solvent standing around here, in this case acetone for example, or for the negative zone resists and you also have these developing solutions that are standing here at the back. And what they can do is now they put it in these, in these boxes, maybe put it in an ultrasonic bath to make sure to shake it well and then uh, rinse it with water and that is how you expose your, or you develop your surface. And then as we've seen already at the end of the, uh, of the day, this is what you, what you then create. And what you need to optimize is, of course, how much UV light you expose, for how long, how long you develop, in order to get very precise features. Otherwise, they will start to wash out, maybe come off the surface, are not completely going to the, to the substrate, and so on and so forth. But very generally, this is how to create surface patterns. And we, in research, very often use them to tailor the properties of our surfaces, you know, wettability, for example, how cells grow on this, um, how eyes um, adheres to it and so on and so forth. But of course this can also be, uh, be used for, um, for, for, for uh, the generation of computer chips and so on and so forth. Good. The next process I want to discuss with you is dip coating and dispersion paints. And in order to do this, let me briefly go back to the blackboard and clean up a little bit. So to start with, let's 
discuss the difference between a solvent-based paint and a dispersion-based uh, paint. And both of them will contain polymers because we need them as a binder material to get our colorful, possibly inorganic material or also white material onto the wall. Sometimes also not. If you want to have a clear painting, then it's just polymers. Then it just makes it scratch resistant, for example. Okay, so what is the difference if we, in, in kind of uh, cartoon style, solvent based? We have already said we have a, a, a polymer. that is free in a solvent. And it is Persian-based. In this case, we have polymer particles. In a solid state, in a continuous phase, which very typically is water. So now, what are the advantages? In this case, it's fairly clear. Well, we have a solvent, so as you spray the solvent to the surface, very similar to, to spin coating, a coating directly forms. Right, so we have film formation Very directly, you don't need to worry about it because the polymer is already in the liquid state. Somehow do I put this? Upon drying or upon application or whatever. So it's very easy to make polymer films. And because the film is very homogeneous and all the polymer chains can directly entangle all the way they want, Let me just put this again, homogeneous film. And as it's homogeneous and very well entangled, all the polymers, we have very good mechanical properties. And this can be a very key asset if you want to make a scratch resistant material, if you want to avoid that your car gets scratches easily and so forth. But it comes at a price. What's the big disadvantage here? Well, it's solvent-based. Solvents for polymers are typically not the nicest and env env environmentally and health-friendly liquids. You know, this can be benzene, for example, toluene, dichloro, um, benzene, and so on and so forth. So it can be very toxic and very problematic, both for you as a human and for the environment. And it requires uh, quite a lot of organic solvents that will typically escape because they're very volatile. So this is the reason why you should really, really, really avoid to paint your room with a solvent-based paint. Now, if you do this, you will go unconscious in a few minutes because the solvent vapors will fill the room and then you, you drop down. Don't think about chloroform as a good polymer solvent and this is uh, kind of infamously used to, um, to kidnap people, you know, to make them unconscious. So it's definitely not something you want. So here comes the dispersion paint coatings. So we see that the polymer exists as a particle in water and as it does so, it needs to dry out but of course, the polymers are still, uh, the polymer is still in a uh, liquid, uh, in a solid form. So the film formation is not so easy. And it occurs in multiple steps. And we will discuss in a second how exactly that occurs. And the quality of this coating 
pretty much depends on the ability of these polymer particles to form a film. So let's put it sim simpler. The coating process can vary because it depends on the film formation. But on the plus side, the surrounding medium is water. So when it dries out, the only thing we release is water and no organic solvent. So it's much more clean, environmentally friendly. Green and non Toxic. So let me put it in this way. At the end of the day, we don't have any other chance but to go in this direction because we want to, first of all, not uh, destroy the environment any further. And of course, we also need to take care of our health. And this is the only option, at least in closed rooms, that we have to form polymer films, which we need to if we want to make sure that our walls stay white or colorful or you know, whatever we want to do. So this is an important step. And now what we need to discuss is how do we actually form such films? And for this, let me. And again, what we will see is that very fundamental polymer properties play a very critical role in doing this. So how do we form films from a dispersion? So it's all in all, it contains three steps. First, we need to somewhat try our dispersion. So in the very beginning, we have our liquid here. And this contains particles. So now in the first step, let me just go here, we will accumulate more and more particles closer and closer to the surface to form a continuous or a densely packed particle arrangement. However, this film still contains individual particles and interstitial sites here. So this film will still look white because it will scatter light, because we have two different refractive indices between these particles and the surrounding medium. So let me put here, it's not a continuous film. No continuous film yet. And there's another complication that we need to take into account, which I do not want to discuss here in detail, but we need to mind the coffee stain effect. Because typically when a water-based film that contains particle dries out, 
it always dries out in the form of a coffee stain. Now you know this from, that's hence the name, from your coffee cup, that you form a circular pattern where most of the material is at the outside, but the inside remains empty. And you need to, need to prevent this by adding a lot of solid content to start with to form a more or less homogeneous film. Okay, but as I said, that's not really something that belongs into a polymer lecture. It's just a very interesting physical aspect in itself on what needs to be done also to these, to these particles to prevent the um, formation of a coffee, coffee stain. So we want to have a homogeneous thin film. However, we also want to make sure that it forms a continuous film and doesn't remain as a particulate coating. Because if it remains like this, there is no adhesion or very little adhesion to the substrate here and here and here. So if this was on my wall and I put my finger on it, my fingers will be, will be white, similar to you know, the chalk here, and I will not have a film that protects my wall. Okay, continuous film yet, but the particles here are in close contact. So a second stage then is that we need to form a film. And this film formation starts with the fact that the particles need to deform. So it goes from this completely particulate film into something that still resembles the particles, but now they are deforming and conforming to the surface. So they will look more like Something like this. So now the particles deform, and now we need to discuss what needs to, like what the criterion is, is to go from here to here. So clearly, the particles need to be soft, and soft enough to move around and to deform. And this is known as the temperature here needs to be larger than the MFT, which is the minimum film forming temperature. Okay, so the particles need to be soft enough that they can deform while they, they shrink together and are in contact. And the minimum film temperature is, as you will see, or as you can imagine, is very similar or comparable to the class transition temperature because the class transition temperature gives us the range where the particles start to be, or the polymers in the particles start to become mobile. There can be slight differences, however, because here we have additional material in there. There can be things on the particle surface that blocks this, you know, prevents um, the polymers from, from moving, surfactants, for example. But there can also be materials in the particle that increase um, this film formation temperature, which is known as plasticizers. So you have a second material that makes the polymer softer to make it easier to form this film. And eventually, this material can then evaporate out to make the film hard again. And in the third step, we then get a complete annealing. So we go from this honeycomb type of structure into a very continuous film. So here, now the difference between these two stages is that here we can still see the shape of the individual particles, but now they are in contact. And this is a result of the particles themselves being a bit soft, either by the help of plasticizers or by increasing the temperatures above the class transition temperature. And this minimum film formation temperature is kind of key. 
And in order to completely anneal them, the temperature really, well, the parameter that is important is that we need to be now much above the class transition temperature, really in order to get polymer chain diffusion, like a polymer chain here, needs now to diffuse in here, and the polymer chain that is in here diffuse in here so that it merges all into a complete material. Okay, in, in practice, of course, this all goes along the drying process if the process is well adjusted, but there's a certain differences between only deformation of particles and still kind of possibly blocking of the interfaces and the complete film formation. So we have several possibilities to introduce this hardening of the film. First, as I said before, we can add plasticizers here to fac facilitate this step here. So we artificially lower the glass transition temperature of our actual polymers by the introduction of a plasticizer, so a solvent or um, a low chain length polymer or something that can eventually be removed again. So if we remove these plasticizers, then we will automatically, without having to do anything else, enhance, increase the glass transition temperature of the polymer film, and this will make the polymer film hard. So this is the simplest and a very convenient way to kill two birds with one stone. We facilitate film formation, and we make the resulting film harder. But we can also, of course, again, employ our polymer chemistry we have developed. We can either introduce um, cross-linking, for example, by UV light. So if we put it outside, UV and US cross-linking. And we know that a crossing film is mechanically more stable. It also lowers the possibility for the polymer chains to rotate and move, and this increases the glass transition temperature. So this will enforce the mechanical properties. Or we can even play around with chemistry and then, for example, change polarity. For example, by exposure to oxygen, a film may oxidize. You may form different functional groups. If you have more polar groups, then you increase the glass transition temperature as well, and this can also make your film hard. So while this is all kind of universal uh, based in the physics of this drying, here we really need to employ chemistry or specificities of the individual polymers. But at the end of the day, you see it's a complex process, but we can really go through these individual steps. And as you see from the paint you can buy in the hardware store, we can really make these dispersion paste paints to work fairly efficiently and obviously much more environmentally friendly than the solvent-based approach. Good. So this is all I wanted to discuss about this film formation. Here on the slides, you have it um, kind of colorful again, and we see that from a very shiny, a very whitish dispersion, we can actually make very transparent protective films. Okay, so here we see these individual steps again, and we also discussed the requirements for polymer particles. Good, in the very last part of this presentation and also of this course, I decided to um, show you a little bit about additive manufacturing because I felt even though this is maybe not at the core curriculum of a polymer science class, it is one of these upcoming processes and I think everybody with a bit of an interest in polymers will also be interested to see how they can be applied in 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So what's the case? I mean, people talk about the third industrial revolution or, you know, printing objects on demand. And of course, the big promise is that with additive manufacturing, you don't need to produce huge machineries, big injection molding forms, but you can really print very customized and very small um, numbers, defined parts that can be really suited for a specific purpose, to try something out, to make it patient specific, and so on and so forth. So you really he here you see a couple of examples. Adidas now started a collection where the shoe sole of the shoe, you see here, is 3D printed. And here they take advantage of the very high flexibility in the design of structures that you can do with um, additive manufacturing. You see this, this very complicated mesh is obviously not something you can create by an injection molding process. And then you can make a shoe lighter 
and maybe even with better cushion than a normal material. So this can be very good for your joints and your knees and maybe for your speed when you run. In uh, biology or biomedical engineering, of course, 3D printing is all the craze because you have this promise to print tissue, maybe even artificial organs, and then help people survive or contribute to the well-being of people by really making functional um, biological objects. And besides, this is, of course, of a very fundamental interest to see whether you can replicate really complicated, dynamic, and, if you want, living structures from nature. Well, and then you have in the field of drug engineering, you can, if you 3D print drugs, you have much more flexibility in drug release and release profiles and so on. In, in industry, you can print very small um, parts and uh, very kind of prototype parts to test out processes before you make them into big machinery, so build the injection molding machine. And of course, in personalized medicine, since everybody's face and everybody's uh, body is a bit different, there you really need to have very customized design. So if you break, let's say, your head, then you want to really have something that fits very well. And all of this, of course, the big promise is that additive manufacturing can deliver that. What is it? So according to this definition here, it's a process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data, usually layer by layer, as opposed to subtractive manufacturing. So we compare this in a second, just to show you what they mean by this um, object data and then 3D printing. Typically, you start with a scan or with an idea what you want to do. So a 3D computer file, this could be based, for example, on, the, uh, on a tomography of your skull to see what is missing. And from this, then a computer will pre-treat that data to slice it up into individual layers and then gives the computer a printing truck to tell it, first print this wing, then print this wing, then start to print the, uh, no, the, the, uh, the thing here, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, then you have your 3D printed objects. And eventually, maybe you need to post-treat, like finish or coat it and so on, but that's the general idea. So, What's the difference between additive and subtractive manufacturing? Some of you may know the Simpsons episode where they explain how a bowling um, pin is produced. Now the bowling pins after bowling, they are all discarded. Then a complete uh, tree is cut. This is um, kind of shaped together into a single bowling pin, which is then painted and put back into the bowling lane. That's of course maybe a bit exaggerated, but this is exactly what subtractive manufacturing does. You take a big chunk of material, then you engineer it and mold and so on, and then create your desired objects and a lot of waste. Well, in comparison, additive manufacturing starts with a powder material or with some type of material, and then it merges this material to a 3D object and creates very little waste. So that's the entire promise of additive manufacturing. So now, what does this have to do with polymers? And I think polymers is one of the key materials that can be 3D printed because it's so easy to reshape and mold them. So you see there's quite a lot of processes that uh, deal with polymers and we can classify this, for example, by the state of fusion. So how do we make these 2D layers and then merge them together into 3D objects? This can be either thermal reactions. So here, once again, we play with the class transition temperature and with the thermal properties of the polymers but it can also be chemical reactions. And here we play with the possibility that we can change by chemistry the state of the polymer. And here again you see the material feedstock can be different. This can be thin filaments, so small solid lines. This can be powders or it can be a polymer in a, or a monomer in a liquid form. And this then gives rise to different processes that I want to briefly introduce. So a liquid polymer that is polymerized by a chemical reaction is stereolithography, for example. Binder jetting is the merging of a polymer powder by a chemical reaction. Selective laser sintering is where you use heat um, provided by a laser to sinter together polymer particles. And the fused deposition modeling is where you use a filament, heat it up, and then really kind of draw your 3D object. Now let's look at these processes in a little bit of detail. So first, we want to discuss stereolithography, and what you do there is you have a liquid monomer or a photo photopolymer that you can uh, photo crosslink, and then you have your building chamber, which is all embedded in this monomer. And as the printing process goes on, this platform is lowered. You have the sweeper that supplies 
a fresh layer of your liquid photopolymer onto this building platform and then you have a laser beam up here that is redirected by lenses to provide laser energy where you want it. And by this you really photo crosslink your polymer layer by layer to shape a desired object. So this is what it looks like. Um, for those of you that are interested, Formlabs has a very beautiful website and uh, you find a lot of videos on YouTube to show how this fabrication is actually done. Works really well, really fast and you really print your object layer by layer fairly quickly. So you have this polymerization induced by a UV laser. The laser is scanning the surface and um, sometimes you require structure supports for overhangs so that you maintain the mechanical integrity. So the advantage here is that you can build fairly large parts very quick with a very high accuracy. But the disadvantage is that you need to rely on this photopolymerization, so the choice of materials is somewhat limited. That being said, every time I check um, um, on the Formlab webpage or talk to a friend of mine that works there, they have a new concept and a new idea on how this works and this is constantly expanding more and more. And these printers are fairly cheap, now you can literally put them on a desktop and this makes it fairly convenient. So here you really employ UV-based photochemistry. The next method I want to talk about is binder jetting. And here you start from a powder, so you have a powder reservoir here that goes up and you have this roller that puts new powder onto your building chamber. As the process proceeds, this building chamber goes down more and more and you have this ink uh, jet printhead that supplies the binder material at defined positions. And then again it goes layer by layer, you get more powder, the computer tells this uh, printer to print binder where it's needed and by this a 3D object emerges. And this 3D object is still embedded in the powder material, so it's inherently stabilized by all the non-bound uh, powder and you don't need any support structures that you need to remove later on. So here again you see one of these like binding chatting facilities, here again is the cartoon and the description again is you have this powder that is built layer by layer, you have a liquid bonding agent which is applied through inkjet printing and the building platform goes down more and more uh, and you don't need any support structure. So the advantage is that it's really fast and cheap, no, you have this powder that goes back and forth and you can do quite a range of different materials because the binder doesn't really need to polymerize the polymer. The polymer is already polymerized and it only needs to somewhat provide an adhesion between the powder materials. And now you can think about what we've learned, what this could be. So either you have some kind of an adhesive that really clues together these different materials, could be a polymeric adhesive for example, it could be um, a solvent that partially dissolves the um, polymer particle parts and therefore merges the, uh, the materials or it could be some kind of a cross-linking or a plasticizer that makes them softer. But the disadvantage here is that still or often you have limited mechanical characteristics because the polymer comes from a powder state and is still somewhat fused together from this powder state. So you don't get a continuous layer often but you can still have remnants of the powder and this then creates easier fracture. But then we have this fused deposition modeling where we start with a thin uh, solid material that is then heated up. Now so we have these spools first for the material and then for the support because in this case now you have this extrusion head that just moves in three dimensions or in two dimensions, extrudes polymer where it should be extruded and then starts in the next layer as the building chamber moves down. So here you need to have support structures in order to avoid collapse while this object is being printed. This is why, why you need to have a support material and a build material. And these need to be chosen in a way that you can easily remove the support material afterwards without damaging your building material. And that's also what you see here. So these gentlemen are currently printing something here and you see that this plastic filament is melted, extruded through a very small nozzle and the material is laid down wherever you want to have it and then it cools down and solidifies. And the support structure then anchors the parts on the platform so provides mechanical stability and needs to be removed afterwards. This is a very simple technique and you can make functional parts from standard plastic so you need to get these filament materials but the disadvantage is that because of the printing you can have a gradient or um, anisotropy in z-direction. 
So the mechanical properties are always better along the material compared to perpendicular to, to the material because this is where you have this, these individual layers that may not be completely fused. And secondly, you may have some type of a surface structure because of these individual um, solidified layers that have been deposit, uh, deposited layer by layer. And the last um, technique I want to introduce is the selective laser sintering process where you have um, a CO2 laser, something that generates heat, which is directed onto the building platform. And you have a powder delivery system that creates new powder. Then the laser melts the powder. And subsequently, you deliver the new layer. The laser melts again. And by this, you stepwise build up your 3D object as well. And in this case, you see, we have the selective sintering by the laser. The platform goes down, so you also build it layer by layer. And very importantly, the process chamber is preheated. And I will tell you in a second why this is important. And here the advantage is that you have some standard plastics that can be printed with very good mechanical properties, also on very large scales. And one of the major developments here is that people try to deliver more powder materials with suitable properties. But the disadvantage is that still or often injection molding still has better mechanical properties simply because it comes from a completely liquefied polymers that then very isotropically can cool down. And this is a challenge in the process because here you still work in this layer by layer fashion from a powder based material. Okay, so in the last two slides, I just want to give you a bit of a flavor on what needs to be thought of when you design such a process. So the first is the thermal considerations for the polymer powder. So typically, for the selective laser sintering, you want to have semi-crystalline polymers because they form um, mechanically stable parts. And you can play around with this crystallization window to tune the mechanical properties. And what is defined then is a sintering window, which is the temperature difference between the crystallization, or to be precise, the onset of the crystallization, and the onset of the melting. And this is where your whole process will take part. So what is happening then is in the very beginning, you apply a new layer. And when the layer is applied, you put your building chamber temperature in the sintering window. So this is this one here. And this T and P here is the temperature of the new powder. So you build a layer and you let it equilibrate to make sure it is hot. Okay, and it's above the crystallization peak, but below the melting peak, so the crystalline domains are still there. That means the powder is mechanically uh, integrated. It doesn't melt, but it's already soft. The amorphous parts are already soft. And now, during the printing process, you want to liquefy the entire polymer. So what you need to do is, when you apply the laser, you kick the polymer from below the melting peak to above the melting peak. So now the entire polymer is in a melt, and then you cool it back down to the building room chamber. But because it, the building room chamber is above the crystallization peak, the polymer is still in the melted state. That means while this process is operating, the entire polymer always remains liquefied. And the new powder is just being melted high enough so that it becomes liquefied as well. And only after the entire building process is done, do you cool down your building uh, room temperature to below the crystallization peak. So to go from here to here, or no, from here to here. And then the material very uniformly crystallizes and therefore becomes mechanically very stable. So that's a very big difference to the filament based, of, based process where each layer solidifies individually. Here you really solidify the entire printed object. Okay, and a second consideration is about powder. So this, again, is not really at the heart of a polymer lecture, but extremely important for the process. So you can imagine that when you create such a, a 3D printed object, the quality of your object is a direct function of the quality of your powder bed, because this is what eventually fuses together. So what you really need to have is a very uniform and high density powder bed. And this can only be achieved if you have a powder that can flow really well. If a powder is very sticky and cohesive, it will never spread out 
efficiently and form a uniform layer. And that's what you see. So we need a high powder by density to, um, to construct dimensionally accurate and mechanically stable parts. So that means if, um, if the powder bed is not uniform and not very dense, then you always have kind of defects in your printed structure and then it's, it's pretty much useless. And the problem is that the polymer powders that are being applied to this process often come from cryogenic grinding here, for example, or from precipitation, and they are very irregular shaped. And irregular shaped materials, of course, do not flow so well. Now consider trying to flow a bunch of spheres down an inclined plane and a bunch of cubes, like dice, for example. And obviously the spheres will flow much better. So it's always preferred to have such spherical shapes. And what then you need to do is either work on fabrication processes that can create such spherical particles, or you need to do in a subsequent step a thermal rounding step to convert such materials into such materials. So you see that the particle shape is very important for the powder flowability. But the second thing is that the surface roughness plays a key role. And here is this model of Rumpf, where they calculate the van der Waals forces between powder particles, so how well the particles stick together. And what you see is, if they have a surface roughness here, you create a minimum in the van der Waals forces. This is without surface roughness, this is with surface roughness. So you can really lower van der Waals forces by making very small surface roughness onto the particle surface to prevent them from coming in close contact. And this is something that is typically implied in such a process by a a second process step where you try coat a nanoscale powder on top of the particles to increase flowability. And finally, of course, you can also sieve or post process your particle size distribution to, de to select the right powder um, sizes for this printing process. Good. With this, I'm at the end of today's lecture and also at the end of the complete um, lecture series. And for today, I just want to summarize we continue to discuss this route from monomer to product, and again, you've seen that to make a polymer product requires much more than just the chemical synthesis, so you really, the, the processing and the engineering behind this is equally important. And you see that there's really a large range of technologies, and we discussed some more advanced examples, such as photolithography, um, dispersion paints, and then all these um, additive manufacturing processes. So now, after following this course, I hope that you really um, see this intimate connection between molecular properties of a polymer, you know, that arise from, from the monomer, from the synthesis and so on, that directly translate into macroscopic properties of a material. And in order to understand this, we needed to go through different fields of polymer science, but I hope that you really got this connection between the nanoscale or the atomic scale and the molecular scale and the macroscale. And this is kind of what I really wanted to achieve with this course. I thank you very much for listening and wish you all the best and goodbye.